Good evening, church. Good evening, church, once again. What a wonderful time in God's presence, right? Even before we start singing, I truly sense that the Lord is here with us. Amen. We give him all praise and worship this evening. We've prayed it forward, and tonight we're just going to respond. Respond to his love, respond to his word, his truth, and what he has spoken to us. We truly believe that there is nothing like being in God's presence. Nowhere else we can be, but right here at his feet. Amen. So just go ahead and just ask him to, to speak to you, to just deposit something in your heart this evening, to lay a word of truth upon you tonight. The Lord is here in this place. Father, we worship you. We lift you up, Holy Spirit of God. We exalt you. You are welcome. Just as we have prayed, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome. You are welcome to inhabit this place, oh God. Come. Come, Lord.
worship you tonight. Our response is to surrender at your feet, Jesus, and to glorify you. So be lifted up tonight. Be lifted up and be exalted here in your house. One more time, give him a shout of praise today. You are worthy, Jesus. As we continue from the book of Psalm 100 from verse 1 it says shout for joy to the Lord all the earth worship the Lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know that the Lord is God it is he who made us and we are his we are his people the sheep of his pasture listen if there's any voice that has told you you are something else tonight we are reading God's truth that we are his, the sheep of his pasture, okay? It continues to say, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I'd like to read that last verse to us. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Come on somebody. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Somebody give him praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
We thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord.
to the Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 So we bless the Lord that indeed we can give him a shout of praise for who he is in our lives. Amen. And one of the names of God is that the Lord who restores us. And when he restores us, he restores our spirits, he restores our souls, and he restores our bodies. He even restores our finances. He restores our relationships. That is the God that we serve. So as we shout to the Lord, as we give him all the praise, I want us to know that he's a God who fulfills his promises. And so we want to come in his presence with thanksgiving, but also to make our requests known to God in prayer. I bless the Lord that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah 32 verse 26 to 27, that this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. I'm the Lord of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? I want you to think about that question. When God asks, is there anything too difficult for me? And maybe you came to this service tonight and there's something in your life that you so believe it's difficult to our God. But I want to submit to us by the authority of the word of God that there's nothing that is too difficult for our God. I like what Charles Swindoll said, that our God is the God of impossibilities. The one who has limitless power, who has never and will never meet an intimidating obstacle he cannot overcome. An aggressive enemy he cannot overcome. A final decision he cannot override. Or a powerful person he cannot overshadow. He is the God of impossibilities. Amen. So I want us to pray tonight and I want us to pray for our restoration. And the first restoration I want us to believe God for is according to the word of God in Psalms 51 verse 12. As David prayed and said, Lord restore thy joy of thy salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And sometimes as we do life, we get to a place where we lose the joy of salvation. I want us in one minute to pray that the Lord will restore the joy of his salvation upon us. Our God and our Father, we pray tonight that you restore the joy of thy salvation upon us. Those of us who have been involved in battle and we are so tired, we are so broken, we are so wounded and we need the joy of the Lord restored in our hearts tonight. Holy Spirit of God, we pray tonight to breathe over us the joy of thy salvation. We pray that, Lord, you refill our hearts, our souls, oh God, with the joy of the Lord that surpasses our understanding, the joy of the Lord that comes out of our relationship with you and not because of the circumstances around us, oh God. So for that brother, for that sister that desires the joy of the Lord. Holy Spirit of God. Have access over every heart tonight. In the name of Jesus. Restore our souls. Restore our joy. To the glory and honor of your name. And the second thing I want us to pray for restoration. Is according to Jeremiah 30, 17. The Bible says that I will restore health unto you. And I will heal your wound hallelujah so for those of us that are trusting God for healing that tonight we lift our hands to God and pray that he will restore to us our health and heal our healing and heal our wounds declares the Lord so come on let's pray those of us that are trusting God for healing tonight that will experience the healing power of God we believe in the miracle working power of God the power of God that is able to heal us tonight and Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever and is in our midst tonight to heal us Holy Spirit of God Jesus we pray tonight 
in accordance to your word in Jeremiah 30, 17, that Lord, you restore health to us and heal our wounds. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, that you will heal our wounds. Every situation tonight that needs healing, it doesn't matter what the doctors have said, oh God. We dare believe your word. We dare take you at your word, oh God, that you restore our health and heal our wounds. We give you praise that the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed tonight. Holy Spirit of God, have access to everybody in this place tonight. And do what you alone can do to the glory and honor of your name. Jesus. Jesus. The Bible says that Lord, your word heals our whole bodies. So we pray tonight for healing. Healing of our blood system, so God. Healing of every situation represented tonight. Jesus Christ, we pray that you'll glorify and honor yourself. We bless you. We honor you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And the last restoration I want us to trust God for is in according to Joel chapter 2, verse 25 to 28. The Bible says that I will restore unto you what the kanga worms and caterpillars have eaten. For I am the Lord, your God. I pray, I pray. I pray that that will be a word for somebody tonight. That the Lord will restore unto us what the enemy has stolen. What the locust has eaten. What the kangawam has eaten. Whether it's your finances, whether it's in the level of your relationships. Whatever it is. That tonight will receive the restoration of God. As he declares to us, he says, I will. There's no doubt about it. He will. So let's lift up our voices to God and pray that the God of heaven will restore everything unto us according to his word. He will restore our families, those sibling relationships, those relationships between parents and, and kids. The Bible says that I will restore the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. Hallelujah. Shanta labo setele ya babasa. Rekantele basata ya bo sikara babo yandala basa. You are a restorer, oh God. Jesus. Whatever the enemy has stolen from us, oh God. Whatever the kangawams, the locusts have stolen from us, oh God. You promise us tonight that Lord, you are God who will restore everything unto us. Lord, even as we worship you tonight, oh God, we pray you restore things in our lives that have been broken, that have been eaten by the enemy. The Bible says that when the enemy is found, he will restore seven times. The Bible says that you'll give us double for our trouble. Oh, Jesus, you'll give us beauty for ashes. I pray that God, you are giving somebody beauty for ashes tonight. You are doing it, O oh God, to the glory and honor of your name. We worship you and we exalt you, O oh God. You are restoring everything. Everything. The Bible says everything. It is not some things, O oh God. Even the ones we think are impossible. You have said you'll restore everything, our God. May it be our testimony tonight that we came into the presence of God. And when we prayed and cried out to you and when we worshiped. You restored everything. So we give you a shout of praise. Because you are the Lord our restorer. And you have restored everything in our lives tonight. To the glory and honor of your name. Come on give God a shout. Thank you Jesus. Name. Thank Amen. You, Amen. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Lord. Thank you for what you have already started to do in our hearts. And in our lives. We bless your name. We bless your name, O oh God. With everything in our hearts, in our souls, we say thank you to you, O oh God, for you are faithful to your word. You keep your promise. What you have spoken over our lives tonight shall come to pass, that indeed you will restore. You will restore the joy of your salvation. You will restore and heal. You will restore and replenish. Where the enemy snatched, you are returning it back to your children tonight 
Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say thank you to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just want to continue to worship you, to return glory and honor to you, God. Thank you, Jesus. This is our thank you song to you for everything you have done, for what you are working in our lives, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. With everything, we give you thanks. A million times will never be To tell all you have done With everything within my very soul I say thank you Jesus A million times will never be enough To tell all you have done With everything within my very soul I say thank you, Jesus. You are faithful, you are good. 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 Everything we have. A million tons. A million tons will never be enough oh, to tell all you have done with everything within my very soul. I say, I say thank you, Jesus. A million tons. A million tons will never be enough to tell.
Oh, thank you, God. You are faithful. A keeper of your word, you are faithful. Time and time again, you have been faithful. We can put our trust in you, God. We can depend on you, oh God. Is there anything too difficult for you? Nothing. We can put our trust in you, Jesus, for you are faithful and you are good. We've come back to say thank you for everything you have done, trusting that you will continue to perform, that you will continue to fulfill your promise over us, God, for you are faithful and truly you are good. Great is your faithfulness, God. Great is your mercy, O oh God. Great are your compassions towards us, O oh God. You have not failed us before. You are not about to fail us again. You are faithful and you are good, God. Surely we can give you thanks tonight when we look upon our lives and we see how far you have brought us. All we can say is thank you, Jesus. For a million tongues will never be enough. A million praises will never be enough. But still, we will give you praise. But still, we will give you thanks. But still, we will worship you. Come on, say thank you to Jesus. Say thank you to Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Tell him. You are faithful. You are good. You are faithful. You come on, come on. Tell him tonight. You are faithful. You are good. Yes, you are. You are faithful. You are good. You are faithful. You. So truly, if you have done it, if you did it before, you will still do it again. You will still do it again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. We declare your name, Jesus. The name that is above every other name. The name that is mighty to save. The name that can cause the atmosphere to shift. Every situation can turn around in God's presence. So tonight we ask that he reigns. Reigns over our hearts and our lives. We want to declare that song one more time. Somebody say atmosphere shift. you You are here touching every heart. 
we can't see it, I want us to raise faith tonight. I want us to transform those words and say, even now, I can see that you're working. Even now, I can feel that you're working. Because Jesus has never stopped working. Jesus has never stopped working. All right? So I want us to raise faith and declare those words, truly believing that he can do the impossible. How many believe that God can do the impossible? That he is the mighty maker. That he is the promise keeper. That he is the light in the darkness. Jesus, we praise your name. And tonight we speak in faith, declaring these words. Even now I can see that you're working. Even now. Impossible. 
people in our lives. So tonight we speak those things to you. We lay our hearts to you, God. We surrender, King of Glory. We surrender control. The things we have held on to, saying this one, I don't think you can. Tonight we are releasing it to you because you know that your word is true. What you have spoken shall come to pass. We believe it today that you are a God who redeems, that you are a God who restores, that you are a God who can heal, that you are a God who can provide, that you are a God who has supplied. You have already done it for us. You have conquered, O King of glory. You have leveled mountains, mountains we haven't even seen or encountered yet. God, you have already gone ahead to do the is who you are. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't it so wonderful that we serve a God who causes us to prevail over any and everything? We say, by the blood of Jesus, I prevail over sickness by the blood of Jesus. I prevail over sickness. I prevail. I prevail.
the blood.
that saved us, it was nothing. Restores nothing but the blood of Jesus. That redeems and makes whole nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing, no one, nothing, nothing else, no one else. White as snow, no other fountain, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on, let's sing it all around this room. We sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, the precious blood that flows. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's take a moment and just thank Jesus for his blood. Let's thank him for the blood that he shed for us. The blood that flowed freely. The blood that has life, the blood that is smeared upon us, covers us, clothes us. This is the blood of the Son of God, the blood of Jesus. It's the blood, it's the blood, it's the blood. The Bible says the life is in the blood. And there's something that happens when we are covered by the blood of Jesus. God sees us through his son. He sees us in the righteousness of his son, no longer through our sin. And no one, no one had a half price deal. Jesus paid the full price. The full payment for the atonement of our sin. For the remission of our sin, for the healing of our bodies, of our bones. It was paid by the blood of Jesus. No one has a lesser deal than the other. See, the blood of Jesus doesn't recognize social class or influence or wealth. Everyone stands ground level at the foot of the cross. And this very blood, it marks a winner. It marks the life of a winner. So if you need healing in this room tonight, if you need forgiveness in this room tonight, tonight, the blood is available. For this blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, the blood of Jesus speaks mercy. The blood of Abel speaks vengeance. And mercy triumphs over judgment. So when we come under the blood of Jesus, there is freedom, there is healing, there is restoration. So in this room, wherever you are, if you are the candidate, a perfect candidate for the blood of Jesus, just lift your hands and in the next few moments, we want to plead the blood of Jesus over your life, your family, over every establishment you have, over your estate. Guess what? This blood is free. It was poured free. It's a gift. It's poured free for all of us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that tonight in this room your blood is flowing freely. Thank you that tonight in this room nothing is blocking the flow of your blood because it is powerful and it is life. Come on, someone celebrate Jesus in this room. Celebrate Jesus in this room.
Hallelujah. He is faithful, he is worthy, and he is kind. In his name, and we say, Amen. you may have your seats briefly in the house of the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Let's appreciate worship team. That was beautiful. That was beautiful worship. Amen. One us here. Praise Jesus. I know some of you are wondering what is not happening. Expecting me to bust out in song any minute now, but don't tempt me. I might just bust out in song. However, my assignment looks different tonight, and I'd love to share the word of the Lord tonight with us, if that's okay with you. For a few moments, my name is Bethel Lasoy, and I serve here in the youth department and in the worship department. Yes. Yes, where are the YAG people? I know you're seated somewhere here. Where are, uh, where are the music guys? Oh, music guys. You did not come for worship night. There you go, there you go. As, and the rumor is true. I am married now. To one standing woman, she's somewhere around the room. She's somewhere in the room. She's somewhere there in the room. So wherever you are, be hi. Psalm chapter 100, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord of the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. He is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And those who are joining us online, Karibuni Sana, we have people watching us from different parts of the country, but also in different parts of the globe. So, Karibu Nisana, welcome to our service tonight. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to gather around and in your presence, in your word. As we take in your word, as we consume your word, may it consume us until we become fire. Until we are set on fire, until we catch fire and the world watch us burn in this fire, and then they too catch fire, and they burn for you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about knowing him, that's knowing God. As the Bible says, know that the Lord, he is God. For those who are old school, I want you to underline something, come into his presence. If you have this old school Bible, just underline, come into his presence, but also underline, know that he is Lord, and he is God. Underline those two, those two things. So tonight in the, our journey of knowing the Lord, we find this passage in Psalm 100 verse 2 that is an invitation. And Jesus, God makes this invitation for us to come into his presence and to know him. To come into his presence and to know him. So how many have heroes whom we can only access through YouTube? If you can only access them through YouTube, then they qualify to be your hero. I have one. She's called Harriet Tubman. She died over 100 years ago, maybe 200 years ago. And the reason why I like her is because she's one of my heroes. It's because how can you hear the voice of the Lord and lead, and lead people from slavery to freedom? So if you have a hero, I don't want to say your hero's name here, but imagine your hero says, sends you a random DM on Instagram or sends you a text message and says, hey, um... Can you come over to my house? So they live maybe in LA or, or, or Roiro, whichever. <laughs> However you look at it, it's okay. They live somewhere there, but they make this invitation for you to come to their home and not just come to their home, eat with them, but also get to know them. So they give you this invitation, someone you've always looked up to, someone who is seemingly unreachable, far beyond you could ever think. Someone whom you've always admired from afar gives you this invitation to come to their home and eat and do what and get to know them. They're making an offer for friendship. So this is the positive place where friend zoning is important. So they want to friend zone you. They want to become your friends. And tonight, we're going to look at a God who's not just a God who sits somewhere in the circle of the earth, who's distant away from us, we're going to see a God who is so close, who is so near, who desires to be near 
to and with us. And he makes this invitation for us to get to know him. You ready? Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 3. You see God strolling in the garden with Adam and Eve. Literally, he's strolling, communing with them. He wants to commune with them. So he's strolling. He's not in a rush. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. God instructs Moses and tells him, Go tell the Israelites to build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Build me a sanctuary. God is pretty serious. Second Chronicles chapter 7. God makes this astonishing entry in the dedication of the temple. And his Shekinah glory, Shekinah, just floods the temple and the priests are flawed. And what God is saying, I have moved in, make room. I have come to dwell among you. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 14, we see Jesus. The word became flesh and tabernacled among men and made his dwelling among men. I love it in the Message Bible. It says that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. So God moved in. There is overwhelming evidence that the Lord desires to be known, that the Lord desires to be close to us. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, it says, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. So from Genesis all the way to Revelation, extreme evidence of God wanting to make a dwelling place with man. He's not just coming into the neighborhood to be that distant neighbor who you wish would have moved a long time ago. You know those neighbors who just 3 a.m. in the morning, they're just blasting the radio. That's not God. He wants to be known and he wants to know you. He's not impersonal. He literally makes himself available and accessible to us. He makes his heart available and accessible to us. And so we see that God is not just interested in in just moving into the neighborhood. You know, he's not just the one-time neighbor who in um, how many Christmas time who chapu zilikwa mob, so you gave out some. You know, he's not that kind of a neighbor. He's that kind of a neighbor literally who wants to be known. And Hebrews chapter 1, it says that Jesus is... Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's nature and character. Meaning, some people say clarity is kindness. God wanted to make it clear that he wants to be known. Because whatever you see in the life and ministry of Jesus, it's actually God. So he's made himself so available that God took human flesh, incarnate, and tabernacled among men. That means he moved into the neighborhood so that he can be known, so that we can stroll together, we can walk together, we can have such a relationship that you do not have to hide. So this is the Lord whom we serve. That when you look into the life and ministry of Jesus, we see a God who's coming in close, who's so accessible and available, who's made himself so vulnerable to the needs of men and to the needs And everywhere in scripture, you find the trails and the traces of God making this invitation. For example, cast your burdens upon him and he will do what? It's an invitation. Come who are thirsty. He will fill you in. It's an invitation. You know, in Isaiah 55, 8, it says, he says, and you may want to go back and uh, and read this context, that my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. And this is actually an invitation to know his thoughts, to know his ways. Not just to be acquainted by his thoughts and his ways, but to be people who can collaborate with him in perpetuating the human project, what we call in Genesis 1, dominion. So we see that God's intention was not just visitation, but it was habitation. He wasn't just coming in, making random visits, leaving shopping, blessing. No, 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 no. He was coming to stay. And the restored heart of man becomes his habitat. Where there is renewal, transformation in the heart of man becomes the place where he dwells. And it becomes the place where we commune. 
Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, you know, the story, what the instruction he gives about prayer, go and lock yourself in the prayer, speak to your father who's in heaven, in the sea, in the secret place. Yes, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then that unseen there actually is secret place. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So God not only wants to be close, but he also invented a way and a place where we can be able to commune and fellowship with him. And this place, we call it popularly the secret place. It's God's idea. It's a venue of encounter where God prepares a feast of revelation and mystery to his friends. It's a place of friendship. It's a place of great intimacy. It's a place that should be messy because we, we, we wrestle with God. We ask God questions. We we submit to his will. We, it's, it's a place where we are open and he's open to us as we're going to see. And so there's this character in the Bible who he wrote about himself and he says he's the most humble man on earth. You might know this guy. It's called Moses. But Moses carries something that's very unique. He has this fire, this desire, this hunger that is so insatiable that he makes a suicidal request. He asks God that he wants to see what? His glory. And what does God do? God says yes. He relents. But God says, no, no, no. No one can see my glory and leave. So what does God do? He stuff him in the cleft of the rock. Takes him to a secret place, a hidden place. The cleft of the rock is practically a secret place where God hid him so that he can see. So in the secret place is a place where God hides us so that we can see. It's a place that we go, it's, it's, it's not two at a time, it's only one person only. And all believers have been given the access to him, to his heart. And what Moses saw there in the secret place is quite stunning because you find that there is this, in, in his camp, people were erecting golden calves. They are doing all these things that was so contrary to the God who wanted them close. But Moses exudes this attitude. What's a kuakemoto? Let, 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 that, let that happen. But I'm going to stay here. And God, what are you going to do? You're going to show me your glory. And God honors that request in that secret place. And he hides him. And sometimes when we go through life, and we do go through life, Sometimes the places of obscurity, you know, you, we are rushing to be exposed, waiting to, rushing to be announced, rushing to see the light of God. But darkness, darkness, may I submit to you, can be good for us to see. Because it's in the dark places that we actually use our faith to see. It's in those spaces where we cannot be able to see what we are supposed to see. And we're like, Lord, I'm going in blind, but I know you're beside me because you are my shepherd. And we're the ones who rush to call darkness evil. Because in Genesis chapter 1, darkness had a purpose. And we see that God created, he separated light and darkness, and light he called it day, and darkness he called it night. So we see that darkness has a purpose. There's something about God covering our eyes, concealing us. Because the word secret place just means to conceal. That's where you get to know God at an intimate level. That's where you get to know his character, his personality, his movement, his ways. As you're going to see how the psalmist says, teach me your ways that I may walk in them. So he gets to this place where he's like, I, you need to teach me your ways. Because God wants to be known. And we're going to see that it's friendship that he's looking for with us, with man. It's friendship. It's always been friendship. Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve, Pastor Brian. I've known Pastor Brian for over 20 years. I'm 23, so maybe when I was three years, give or take. So maybe perhaps in this room here, in this front line, he's the one who's known me the longest. And by virtue of him knowing him, knowing me the longest, he's, he knew me since I was a dancer, which I still am, yeah, to a teenager. He's seen me through those stages, right? And there's something about, also I've, I've seen him, but there's something about me, us having a relationship over the years, is that I know what is true about him and what's not true. Let me indulge you. For example, 
If someone says, ah, oh, Pastor Brian, that guy, ah, oh, malicious, evil, wicked, ah. Oh. And I'm like, no. There's no way he's wicked, malicious, evil. Ah, no, 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 no. You can actually vouch for his character. I can vouch for him because I know him. Because we've walked a journey together and I'm able to recognize his habits. So the ways of the Lord are like the habits of the Lord. That which is proven over and over again in the Bible. He's gracious, he's kind, he's merciful. He's compassionate. And so Moses gets to this place where he can actually vouch for God's character. Because he knows God's character. And so when we're talking about teach me your ways, because we want to be a people who get into the heart of God, coming close. He's, made, he's already made his dwelling, so we want to come close. And so what we have to do for us as believers, we ask him, teach me your ways, and the classroom session begins. And so I'm just going to go through something I just put together. Maybe it's called the levels of knowing God. I was tempted to use dimensions of knowing God. <laughs> and I was going to stick with levels. So as we walk through our journey, we're going to see that they perhaps could be more but three types of believers who have these different relationships with Jesus. He's already made the invitation and the access, but they have these different types of relationship. So John chapter 15, verse 15. Jesus says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So there's a change of relationship, there's a change of God. So he no longer calls them servants, because servants are not, ooh, servants are not privy to the secrets, to the information. Servants, the end goal, the end game is their pay, and they're gone. But Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because there are secrets that he has for his friends. But when you go back to verse 14, when you take it from the verse 14, it says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And then no longer do I call you slaves. Master is doing. So it's our obedience. It's our obedience that makes us be called friends it's when we do what he commands us to do that's when in the journey of knowing him better and deeper it's our obedience that gives us this place where we are able to know God and know him deeper so you remember I said the three levels like something like three so first level those who don't know God and this has I call them strangers. These are strangers. These are people who, they are believers, yes, but obedience is optional. Obedience is voluntary. It's if. So God, if you, if you are there, if you do this for me, I'll do this for, for you. Obedience is, is something that is, I can choose where to obey I, I, when I have time. When I have time, I'm, I'm going to actually choose to obey you. And these people pose no threat to the kingdom of darkness. Why should they pose any threat? They have no knowledge of who God is. They neglected the invitation. And even if the invitation was given, the obedience that comes with this invitation is not actualized. So let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 24 to 25. And I know you've read this passage many times that I like us to see it differently. So it says, Now the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter, where you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid, so I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what is yours. So the main problem about people who are strangers here is when you look at this talent. This is the talent of the servant who was given, uh, it's a parable of the servant who was given one talent. His knowledge of God was false. He, in his head, he had this false knowledge which lent, quote unquote, false worship and got him into big trouble. 
And you can see that this is not actually the character and the nature of the master because the two others, who, the ones who are given five and two, they actually produce food because they knew the master. But this one, look what it says. Master, I knew to, you to be a hard man. His knowledge. So reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And this ended really badly. So the servant misunderstood the character of the master. He actually didn't know what the master needed, what the master wanted. And it became, he became a strip. He acted like a stranger. He was already a servant, if so you will. He was already given the invitation, but he did not take time to know. And so there's a danger in being on the stranger zone. Stranger danger. Is there something in Matthew chapter 7 that says, away from me, I do not know you. It actually says, you're strangers, I do not know you. But these people are like, Master, we cast out demons, we did all these things, we healed the lepers, all these things. But Jesus is like, no, 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 I don't know you. And it gets scary because these are people who moved in signs and wonders. These are people who healed. These are people who did the works the works of salvation, but Jesus did not know them. So you actually ask yourself, what happened? Trail that back. What happened to this person, to this stranger? Because a form of religion, these people are in, involved in something that we call a form of religion with no power. So it's okay to come to church, to check boxes, to tick boxes, to, you know, provided I've just read the word prayed I have I have nothing more that I want to do it's church is just a place that I go to uh, ju- going January Easter December it's, it's one of the places I tick and we run in the danger of being strangers the second level or second zone and I want to call it acquaintance and these are those who know him but don't get close enough So yes, you know him, but you do not get close enough. And here, obedience is conditional. It's conditional. It's I will obey depending on my state. So people in this level, they value political correctness over God's truth. They value self-expression over obedience. They're similar to the rich young ruler. You know, the guy who really, really admired Jesus, his teachings, his ways. And then he approached Jesus and Jesus was like, ah, no, 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 go sell Go sell everything you own. Jesus there is not, he is not averse to wealth and money. Jesus was merely pointing out the place of his active idols. It's like, this thing still has your heart. Go deal with this because I can see that you don't want to follow me. So we can call this guy a fan. He was a fan of Jesus more than a follower. And Jesus wasn't looking for a fan base. Jesus is looking for true worshippers. He's not looking for fan base. And in this place, this guy literally leaves the presence of Jesus. An invitation was made and he leaves the presence of Jesus so heartbroken. And the danger of staying in this zone, of just knowing God but not getting close enough, is I'd like to call something John 10.10. 10. You know John 10.10? 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and... Aha, uh-huh. but when you go up, 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 it actually starts by the, the, my sheep know my voice. They know my voice. And so this actually talks about false teaching, false doctrine. And in this stage, the acquaintance people, they are buffeted by every... There's a new teaching. There's a new church. You know, they, they, they aren't driven by long obedience towards the same direction. It's more of short obedience, let's do this. And the danger of John 10.10 10 here is that the thief, who's the enemy of our soul, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, we know stealing. Something, when something is stolen, you can easily replace it, right? Killing, that's quite something. But destroy. This is the end game of the devil. It's to actually wipe out the evidence of God in your generation, in your destiny, in your life. So this, this zone is quite dangerous because the enemy just doesn't want to to steal or kill, he wants to destroy. You are, you are, you are a threat. You're posing, you're posing like a serious threat now. And he wants to take any evidence of God in your life. In the final zone, it's I call the friend. Obedience in this zone is unconditional. 
It's walk with God and continually seek to know him. It's those who know him and those who continue to know him. Just like Abraham, who's like, Lord, I'm about to lose my only child, but I trust you. Here is my obedience. Moses, in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 11, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. So it is possible for the Lord to speak to you, to relate with you the way a friend speaks to another. It's been proven. It's evident. Moses knew God's heart so well that when God wanted to smite the Israelites for making a golden calf, and literally, you remember the story in Exodus chapter 32? God wanted to literally wipe out the children of Israel. But Moses was like, no, 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 no. Remember what you promised. You couldn't have brought us all the way from Egypt just to kill us. What will the other nations say? And immediately he became an intercessor. His whole life at that point became an inter, stood in the gap between God's anger and the children of Israel. And the Bible says something so profound. God changed his mind. Yes, God is infallible. He's immutable. He's, he doesn't make any mistake. However, in this passage, we see that God made himself vulnerable to this human process. And so it's in this friend zone where we get to collaborate with God to change destinies, to rewire destinies. We get to collaborate with God to become more than just church attendees. We get to design, design the destinies of generations through the word of God, through his spirit. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 145, one generation will commend God's work to another so this generation is apportioned the glory, a greater glory of God. And we are, we are supposed to carry this glory to the next generation. We are supposed to say like a baton. Here's what God did in our home, in our, in our nation. So here's the next generation. And it takes to know God, know his ways, to know how he moves, how he works. And one of the dangers about, if you're not careful about Christianity nowadays, it's, it'll look more like a museum than a movement. You know, a museum is... Uh, this is the staff of Moses. This is what he used to part the Red Sea. Ah, this, this, is, this is Saul's, uh, Lot's wife. Yeah, this is the area where he, she was turned into salt. And so God's works become relics and collection. And you know a museum is merely a fancy graveyard. So we've buried everything that God did, God wanted to do, all because we did not know God and we did not move in him. And so many of us here, you know, sometimes the temptation is to run ahead of yourself. You're like, yes, I want to do things for God. I want to, I want to, you have zeal. But sometimes that zeal leads you to burnout because you don't submit yourself to the authority and the power of the Lord. You don't submit yourself, you don't surrender. You know, we want depth, but no death. It actually costs us. It costs us to move into the friendship with Jesus. It costs us to let go of every other love that we had and pursue this one God, this one King. It costs us something to know him. Paul says, as I close, Paul says that I want to know him. I want to know Jesus. I want that I may know him and the power of his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may, I, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So in this friendship place, there isn't a rival. Paul has done so much. He had inexpressible things, but he still wants to know God. He still wants to get deeper into his word. And I love what Pete Scazzaro says in Emotionally Healthy Church about understanding the nature of God. So there's a direct effect on Paul's life, on him knowing God. Let me read it for you. So Pete Scazzaro writes, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6, written in AD 49, after being a Christian for 14 years, he writes about the apostles this way. That means Paul writes about the apostles this way. As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. Paul here appears proud and headstrong. Six years later, in AD 55, he writes to the Corinthians in a more humble manner, I am the least of the apostles, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. 
Five years after that, in AD 60 and 25 years after becoming a Christian, he proclaims, I am less than the least of all the Lord's people in Ephesians 3.8. Finally, two years before his death and perhaps after walking with Christ for 30 years, he is able to see clearly and say, I am the worst of all sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 So walking with God gives us a true litmus of who we are. We, be, we begin to see him clearer and clearer. When Paul started his ministry, you know, he, there was a sense of headstrong, you know, like as for those who are held in high esteem, he's like, six years later, he's like, he's a bit humble. I am the least of the apostles. Five years after that, he's like, ah, I'm, the, I'm, I'm less than the least of all Lord's people. And then finally, before his death, two years, he's like, yo, I'm the worst of sinners. There's something about knowing God in who he is that we begin to see ourselves through his mercy. We begin to see ourselves through what he did, the very nature and character of God. We begin to live by it and see ourselves by it. We begin to be humble. How many know that word, humble? Imagine it took all these years for Paul to actually his humility to go deeper and deeper in Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. Of course, we have three invitations here and before we go to the, to get to these invitations, I'd like, there are people who, perhaps you're watching on the screen and you're in this room, and during this worship service, during the songs, the prayers, the ministry, you had a nudge. There was something about you, there's something in you that was, ah, I want to know this Jesus. I want, I want to get to have a relationship with him. I want to go deeper. I want to have this revelation and this ministry that they're talking about. Well, I want to tell you something that is not popular. Oh, it's amazing, but it's going to cost you. It's costly. And you will need to, you need to leave the world behind and follow Jesus. And so if you're watching us tonight and in this room and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, shoot that hand up, up high. Up, up high. And in, also, if you're watching on screen, please go to us on 21210, and we'd love to connect with you and have this fellowship with you. There's someone there who wants to walk with you. Is there anyone who wants to have this relationship that's going to be the beginning of an adventure of a lifetime? Amen. Those who've been living like strangers, who obedience is... It's optional, but you want to come in close. Have a hand here. And you want to come in close. That's you shoot that hand up, up high. Up high. Thank you for those hands. You just want to come in close. You no, know, you, there's this cycle perhaps you have of being on fire for Jesus and then the fire is being put off. And then you choose when you want to obey him. That's you again. I'd like to give us an opportunity. Please shoot that hand up. Thank you so much for those hands. For those who, those who know God but they don't get close enough. There's always something that comes, you know, comes in between you and that intimacy. It's, there's always something. There's a man, a woman, a job, a relationship that makes you not come as close and give you all and surrender to Jesus. Please lift up your hand. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those hands. Oh, Namasa. Thank you, Jesus, for those hands. You see their heart and you've wired them so well that you know everything about them. And so, Lord, we ask that you meet them where you are. Begin to start a fire within their souls that is going to, 
that the world is going to see and they will catch fire too. Holy Spirit, let your fire begin to burn in them in such a way that it's uncontainable. No one can extinguish it. Lord, fill them with tears. Fill them with tears of worship when they worship you, Lord. Fill them with joy of your presence. For those who, who want to be friends. Now I want to... And I, can I just say something? There's something about lifting up your hand. It's a step of faith. Step is not just a leg moving in front. This, you are ushering yourself into the faith realm. And I'd like you to lift up those hands. For those who God has been giving you, especially dreams at night, or you've been finding yourself reading the word of God at night, or you've been finding yourself having dreams and just some weird stuff. doesn't have to be weird. And you're like, God, what's this? And perhaps God is making an invitation into friendship to collaborate with him, to change the destiny of your family, to be such an effective worshiper and intercessor. For those who want to be friends with Jesus, please, let's do this. Let's just lift up our hands to him and Begin to ask him, fill us with your courage, Lord, to stand against the waves, stand against the wind. Fill us with your fire, Jesus. Lord, ruin me for the ordinary. Wreck me for the ordinary. That which has always been ordinary. Let it become the floor upon which we stamp and it tread upon and we step upon, my God. Lord, there's always more, there's always more. You're drawing us in, there's always more because you're a God who comes close and who wants to be known and who wants to know us in communion, in community. So for those who have lifted up their hands, Lord, give them new dreams. Open their eyes to see clearly. For those who are going to, you're going to send them into hiding, my God, give them the grace to sustain them during this hiding season as they see things like the way Paul says, I saw things that were inexpressible. Lord, reveal yourself to them. Transform their heart. Let their heart be tender, my God. May brokenness mark their life. May vulnerability mark their life. May forgiveness mark their life. Thank you, Jesus, that you've always been so kind as to reveal yourself to us through your Holy Spirit. You've always made yourself so accessible to us and so available to us. We thank you and we bless you in your name. And we say, Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. God bless you. You may have your seats briefly. I'd like us to go into a time of giving. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. Please, can I say something about... Sometimes we think that we need to fall down. We need to have this dramatic experience for God to move in us. It's not a must. It can happen. It can manifest. But mostly the change that happens within our hearts when perhaps we even sat... And even lifting up your hand, it was like, you're so tired of living the life you lived. You, don't, you didn't even want to leave your, life, your, your hand. God wants to meet you. God is going to meet you. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. I'm going to read that very fast. It says, it says, the cheerful giver. Remember this. The point is this. Wherever... Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me get context to this. The context for this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now I'm going to read that. Now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles come down, came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. 
I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves. So this phenomenon of them giving in their dire poverty is explained as first they had given themselves unreservedly to who? To God and then to us. The other giving flowed, simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their lives. Again, these people gave themselves to God. And that's why giving was so easy for them. The Macedonians funded Paul's ministry and we hear here that they gave out of their extreme poverty. Out of nothing. These people brought something. And the Bible says it's because they gave themselves to God. So when we are giving, when the Bible talks about cheerful giving, it's teaching us about the heart of generosity. And that's the heart of the king, and that's the heart that we should carry. And this comes when we give ourselves reservedly to him. That means, God, use my money to change the world. Use my finances to heal that which you need to heal. Anyone who walks through my house, my house is going to be a hospital for the sick, for the wounded. It's not just going to be an entertainment hotspot. Lord, use everything. And this is radical generosity. And church, you have been so generous. I remember 2020, you all gave at a time when, I can only compare you to the Macedonians at this point, at a time when everyone was scaling back and hiding, you gave. And because of your generous giving, one of the things that happened in One Nation, One Worship, just in one night, in a couple of hours, we had 190 people come to Christ. Okay. So this is not just data. These are not just statistics. These are human beings. These are souls. Because of what you gave and how you gave, we are able to reach so many more people through TV ministry, through online ministry, through uh, into Kenya, Africa, and all over the world. So many testimonies of people who are on the verge of suicide. But because we are able to go on TV there, they were able to find salvation. And we were able, God was able to partner with us, collaborate with us to meet them at their point of need. So thank you so much for giving. And I want to encourage us to give. First of all, let's give ourselves unreservedly to Christ. Let's pray. Let's lift our hands and pray. Lord, thank you for the offering that you have given us. We know the, greater, the greatest offering is that which you gave through our son, to your son, Jesus. And you modeled so perfectly what giving looks like. You never held back. You could have sent Angel Gabriel, Angel Michael to do the work of the cross. But no, you sent your son, Jesus, such an extravagant show of giving such radical generosity so today as sons and daughters of as people who want to get into the level of being friends with you and get deeper we want to collaborate with you in changing destinies in changing our city in changing our families our nations in changing all those things lord that the darkness the enemy the kingdom of darkness has usurped and taken and it feels defeated through our giving to the gospel. Good news is able to spread to those who are in underground churches, to those who are not able, my God, to see and to be and to, and to fellowship physically because they are being persecuted. Through our giving, Lord, we are able, my God, to feed the homeless, to feed the orphans, the widows, to care for those who are vulnerable. My God, through you, our giving, my God, we are able to practice true religion. Thank you for the capacity to give wealth. Thank you. So we give ourselves unreservedly to you. In Jesus' name, amen. What the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it around, turned it around. What the enemy meant for evil, God has
has turned it around for my good.
more time, say. What the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it around. Come on, receive that word tonight. church again are you excited you came to church we began by saying put an expectation true lay an expectation and indeed our lord is good and is faithful and he will turn it around amen let's celebrate jesus again in this place awesome 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 let's celebrate jesus thank you jesus Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. We are coming to the end of the night and I want first of all to appreciate you all for joining us tonight. First of all, let's appreciate some special guests in the place. If it's your first time here, it's your first time for a worship night experience, we'll want to acknowledge you. Please just give a shout out. Awesome, awesome. Karibu sana, karibu sana, karibu sana in the room. We're next to a visitor. Also, we have People who are watching online, let's give the guys watching online a good view of the room. Thank you so much, our online audience. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're a visitor online and in on-site, please text us in the number 21210. Please text the name visitor in the number 21210. We want to know you more as a church and just give you information about ICC and how you can plug in better. So first of all, thank you so much for tuning in till the end. And if you're here also, please text the number 21210. Hapo sawa? Secondly, if you gave your life to Christ in this room, if you gave your life to Christ during the, uh, through, during the service, and even if you're watching online, we'll want to walk with you as a church. First of all, let's celebrate them. Let's celebrate them. Hallelujah. Hallel we celebrate with you. We know you've made the best decision of your life. You are now in a journey of being a friend of God. Ha <laughs> ha. Being a friend of God, it's the best, best thing ever. So if you have given your life to Christ, as a church, we'll want to walk with you and give you the first initial steps. So please do, again, I implore you with the mercies of God. Please send, the num send, send your name to the number 21210. Please send your name with the number two one, to the number 21210. There's someone on the other end of the line who is ready and waiting to walk with you the initial steps. Sawa, sawa. So let's celebrate again the guys who've given their lives to Christ. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Again, I say it's the best thing to be in the presence of the Lord. The Bible tells us again, in His presence, there is fullness of joy. So I hope you are feeling joy, yeah? The Bible tells us there is pleasures evermore. Pleasures evermore. At His right hand, there are pleasures evermore. In His presence, there is freedom. In His presence, there is liberty. In His presence, it's ripe for a miracle. For him to turn around, hallelujah. Hey. For him to turn around your situation. So I pray, as you go home, before we finish, there's one more song to speak of the greatness of God. That before you go home, that you will experience his goodness. Let me just leave you with the words of Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, the Bible tells us. And my... Ephesians 3, chapter 14. That this is my prayer to you guys as you leave. I pray, Paul was praying to the Ephesian church, and I pray the same to you, that I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you 
with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And you to know that this love, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, more than we can, more that we can all ask, think, or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That that may be alive to you. So now turn to, oh, uh, let's celebrate Jesus. Sorry, sorry. Now turn to that very awesome neighbor of yours. Give them a high five. Tell them thank you for being awesome company. Uh, tell them for being awesome company. Online church, we thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Turn to your neighbor in the house. Maybe it's your relative. Please tell them thank you for being awesome company. Ask them if they have... Uh, Ask them this very question, very fundamental question. Ask them, do they have dinner? Do they have supper? If they don't have dinner or supper, but in the house, we have you covered. There is a tent there on the left outside that has food. Not for free, it's for a price. So, if you've sat to that preferred neighbor, my brother, my sister, it's your time. Yeah? Hebu jitokeze. Cheza kama? Aha, cheza kama wewe. Eh? God will turn around your fortunes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he has turned it He has turned it around. He has turned it around. He has turned it around. Now let's share with him or her the words of the grace. Mwangalia kundani ya macho. Mwangalia kwenye macho. Mwangalia kwenye macho. Mwambia can buy you dinner tonight or today. Mwambia, and now, may the grace. <laughs> and forevermore. Amen. Please don't go. We have one more song to go. Have a good evening, guys. Goodbye, all my church. Shout God of the